Hello, and welcome to another podcast by the School of Surgery. My name is Ricky Ellis, an Academic Foundation trainee at the Royal Derby Hospital. And I'm joined today by Christine Taylor, Psychiatry Registrar, working with the Mental Health Liaison Team, also at the Royal Derby Hospital. Today's podcast will be discussing delirium. We'll be discussing what delirium is, why it's important, how we recognise it, who's most at risk of developing delirium, how we can prevent it, and how we can treat it. So, Christine, would you mind first defining what delirium is for us, please? Yes, so delirium literally means to deviate from one's furrow, uh, which is a ploughing metaphor, and it refers to an acute decline in mental functioning. In the past, it used to be referred to as an acute confusional state, um, and you could also consider it to be an episode of acute brain failure, but delirium is now the preferred term. Brilliant, thank you. And what are the clinical features of delirium? Well, it usually has a very acute onset, um, usually developing over a couple of days, and um, some of the key clinical features are disturbances in consciousness, cognitive function and perception and it tends to have a fluctuating course and those clinical features can be quite useful to look for to try and differentiate it from dementia whereas in dementia there's a very chronic gradual onset of cognitive difficulties usually Um, with delirium it is a much more acute onset. The other thing that can help to tell them apart is the degree of difficulties with attention and concentration. Okay thank you. Now, there's different types of delirium, isn't there? I wonder whether you could possibly explain what these are. Yeah, so we can break it down into three main types. The first type uh, we would call hyperactive delirium, and in that uh, patients present with heightened arousal, restlessness, agitation and aggression. So those are the sorts of patients that tend to come more readily to light on the wards. Um, There's also a type called hypoactive delirium, during which patients are more withdrawn, quiet and sleepy, and often this can get confused for depression or even go unnoticed, and that type of presentation is more common in older, frailer patients and perhaps in palliative care uh, patients. The third type of delirium is a mixed type in which you get both features of hyperactive delirium and hypoactive Hypoactive and mixed delirium can be more difficult to recognise and probably have a worse prognosis overall. Okay, thank you. And why is understanding delirium important? Well, it's very common, uh, particularly in certain settings. Some studies have shown a 20 to 30 percent prevalence on medical wards. On palliative care and ICU, it's probably much higher than that. And uh, studies have shown between 10 and 50% of people having surgery will develop an episode of delirium. It's also very common in long-term care settings, and it has um, very potentially adverse outcomes, so it's important that we try and prevent it, and if it develops, that we manage it um, as best we can. Okay, and and like you mentioned, there's potentially uh, very bad consequences of delirium. For example, it can be extremely distressing for both the patients and their families um, during the periods of confusion and agitation. Uh, Delirium is associated with longer hospital stays as well, an increased incidence of dementia. More hospital-acquired complications, which include falls and pressure sores, for example, Uh, they're more likely to need to be admitted to long-term care and there's actually a higher mortality rate associated with patients that suffer with delirium. There is very much a link between dementia and delirium and we know that there's an 8.7 fold increased risk of dementia in patients who've had delirium compared with those that haven't in the um, age group over 85 and um, 50% of healthy over 65 year olds who get delirium and end up in hospital um, will develop dementia in the next two years and 30% of those will either die or be in long-term care. So it does have potentially very adverse outcomes. The link with dementia is a bit unclear, but there's different models to look at this. One is that it's a risk factor for dementia. The other is that delirium acts as a marker for an emerging dementia. And the third sort of model is that perhaps delirium accelerates the course of an underlying dementia. Okay, so it's extremely important to uh, pick up early on the wards then, isn't it? Um, So let's just discuss how we recognise delirium. We've mentioned a few of the key clinical features of delirium, which include changes or fluctuations in behaviour, but also uh, decline or change in cognitive function, for example, changes in concentration or slow responses or confusion, which is often picked up by patients' family or or staff on the wards. Uh, There can be changes in perception, for example, hallucinations. 
And then there's also physical changes, which include things like reduced mobility, reduced movement or restlessness, agitation, changes in appetite or sleep disturbance. These are the sort of things you often get called to on the wards, especially, for example, on night shifts, asked to see a confused patient who's agitated. There's also changes in social behaviour, lack of cooperation with uh, reasonable requests or withdrawal from social uh, situations, um, or alterations in communication, mood uh, or attitude. Yes, looking for the clinical features is extremely important, but we know that quite a large number of patients with delirium will go unnoticed. And um, one thing that can be very useful to try and improve the rates of detection of delirium are to use uh, screening tools. There are a couple of screening tools that are quite useful. Um, there's one called the 4AT and the other's called the CAM, um, and they're both readily available on the internet uh, for clinicians to use in clinical practice. Um, if I just briefly go over the 4AT, it has sort of four domains. It looks at level of alertness. The AMT, which is a four-pointed um, score in which the person needs to give their age, date of birth, their current location and the current year, and they score a point for each of those. Um, there's also a section on attention where they're asked to give the months of the year backwards. And that on its own can be quite a useful way of assessing someone's level of attention and concentration. And it also looks for acute changes or a fluctuating course. So those four domains get scored and it gives you a probability um, of whether there is delirium present. The other tool is called the CAM and that's the confusion assessment method. And again, that's readily available on the internet. And it again has four areas that it looks at. The first is the acute onset and fluctuating course. Second is looking for features of inattention. The third part is looking for disorganised thinking. And the fourth part looks at their level of consciousness. And I think it's important to say with level of consciousness that um, these changes can be quite subtle. When we talk about conscious level, we might think about somebody sitting in a chair unconscious, but it often can be very subtle deficits in their attention. Um, and it can sometimes be quite difficult to pick up those changes. Conversely, they might also be hyper alert and hyper vigilant. Um, so that's something that clinicians really need to be careful to look for, make sure that they assess. Thank you, that's very useful. So why do you think that delirium is often missed in the initial period? Well, some, sometimes it presents less acutely. Um, on other occasions, it might present in someone who has a pre-existing dementia and the confusion might get labelled as being part of the chronic confusion. Um, as we've already said, it's a condition that fluctuates quite markedly from hour to hour and day to day. Um, and if clinicians see somebody at a point where they're less confused, they may not pick it up. So it's important to look at a longitudinal uh, picture. And it is a very heterogeneous condition, so it presents very differently in different patients, which again makes it very difficult to uh, confidently diagnose. Of course, yeah. And who's most at risk of developing delirium? Well, I think there's four main risk factors that are really useful to consider. Um, one is that it increases in frequency with age. Um, the second is that if people have an underlying dementia, then they're much more at risk of getting delirium. And the other factors are uh, people who have severe illness. And of course, if we're looking at a hospital population, most of the people we see would fit into that category. And the fourth uh, key risk factor is hip fracture, which is obviously relevant to yourselves in the School of Surgery. Okay. Now, in delirium, prevention is uh, often better than cure. Therefore, I think now that we can identify the patients that are most at risk, it's ideal to try and uh, find these individuals and put measures in place to reduce their level of risk of developing delirium. Things that we can do to prevent the development of delirium include good nursing care, uh, consistency between teams, and also try to minimise uh, environmental stimuli such as moving between rooms and wards and being aware of the times that, uh, that people need to move between uh, different environments if this needs to happen. Other environmental stimuli to consider uh, include lighting and signage, uh, making sure that a clock and calendar are easily visible for the patient to orientate themselves, regular reorientation of the patient, and helping them in cognitively stimulating activities such as reminiscing, having familiar music on for them, um, for example, or photos. Also, try and encourage regular visits from friends and family.
From a clinician's point of view, we can try and ensure that they're adequately hydrated, that their bowels are functioning regularly, try and treat any hypoxia that's present, promptly address any infections, address any immobility and encourage early mobilization post-surgery. Also address any pain issues and uh, be considerate of any polypharmacy. Have a look at their nutrition and consider any hearing or visual aids as well. Make sure they're uh, used and in good work in order. Try to promote good sleep patterns and sleep hygiene by keeping the noise down, avoiding interruptions during the sleeping hours. Many of these are aspects of a comprehensive geriatric assessment on the wards. So we, we do all that to prevent delirium, but how do we treat delirium, Christine? Well, firstly, we need to see if there's an identifiable underlying cause and if there is, treat that. Uh, but I think it's really important to stress that in about a third of cases of delirium, we won't find a single identifiable underlying cause. The other measures that we can use are to effectively communicate with the patient and try and reorientate them, as that can be quite helpful in their recovery. Um, one thing that can be really useful is to get family and friends to visit and if possible to come in outside of visiting hours to provide some continuity for the person and aid in their recovery process and have a think about the care environment and whether there's any changes that we can make that, that might also be helpful. The first line for managing agitated behaviour is always to try um, verbal de-escalation techniques and try to engage with the person and calm them down in that way. Um, occasionally this proves ineffective and the person continues to be very distressed and if that's the case then the short-term use of psychotropic medication can be useful. Um, studies have more recently shown that benzodiazepines are probably best not used as first line as they can worsen confusion and guidelines would suggest that very small doses of haloperidol or olanzapine might be the most appropriate action and we should use the lowest dose possible for the least amount of time to manage the agitated behaviour. Um, once the person is medically stable and any underlying identified causes have been treated, then there is evidence to show that trying to facilitate an early discharge from hospital back to a familiar care environment can be very useful, but this obviously depends on the amount of support that that person has available to them in the community. Um, so once the person is medically stable, looking at discharge planning is a really important part of care. I think it's really important to remember that delirium can persist even if the underlying cause has been found and treated and we need to make sure that we allow adequate time for recovery and remember that we should be treating the person and not their test results. Okay, so, so what should we do if uh, we're treating a patient with delirium and the delirium isn't resolving? Well, the first thing to do would be to reevaluate and see whether there's anything that's being missed and sometimes um, underlying causes can start to um, emerge after a period of time. If the case is, is quite uh, complicated and not resolving, then consider referring to the mental health liaison team um, for their assessment and input. And I think if it's not resolving, then the possibility of an emerging dementia starts to, to raise its head and that needs to be given consideration. But, but also remembering that delirium can persist for weeks and months, um, so it's making sure that adequate time for recovery has been allowed. Brilliant, thank you. That's very useful. And have you got any uh, sort of suggested reading if we want to uh, look into this a bit more? Well, there's the NICE uh, clinical guideline 103, which is called Delirium Diagnosis, Prevention and Management. And that's quite a useful document. It looks at many of the aspects that we've discussed today um, and gives some further guidance on that. Brilliant. Thank you. So that brings us to the end of this podcast on delirium. To summarise, remember, think delirium in any patient presented with an acute change in their mental state. Remember that prevention is better than cure. Identify your high-risk patients and implement preventative strategies where possible. When an individual develops delirium, treat the underlying cause and modify the environment as much as possible. We hope that you found this podcast useful and informative. Thank you, Christine, for joining me today. Please check out the School of Surgery for more educational podcasts. Thank you for listening to another podcast brought to you by School of Surgery. Remember, you can follow us on Facebook at School of Surgery, on iTunes, on podomatic at schoolofsurgery.podomatic.com and finally by searching School of Surgery on YouTube. Thank you very much and see you next time.